science and technology, technology, and transportation and transportation and railroad. railroad. Railroad technology Railroad research. order against anything that is extreme. And then the House side under reconciliation is 218 votes, same, same as that. A little bit about the reconciliation process, and that's why when you hear about, well, we might just go it alone, we won't do a bipartisan bill, we'll use reconciliation. Well, there are some things that may not make it through reconciliation, so you couldn't do probably a whole transportation authorization bill through reconciliation. And I've highlighted one of the reasons. It says that one of the points of order is, is against anything that produces a change, but it's only incidental to the budget. So you're just, um, it's incidental to the non-budgetary components of the provision. So that's, that's sort of what they have to look at to determine something could be made in order. Creates a funnel. That funnel has a name, and her name is Elizabeth, Elizabeth McDonough, and she is the parliamentarian of the Senate. So basically, the parliamentarian will make a decision as to what is extraneous or not. So that's where this discussion about if you do a, a reconciliation process, what ultimately can make it through it in terms of transportation. So I'll talk next a little bit about the current FAST Act, and then we'll get into the proposals that are out there. And again, hopefully I've given a little bit of background as to the lay of the land legislatively, why certain uh, me methods might be preferred over others. So first is the existing FAST Act program. And so those are all the different uh, FAST Act and all the programs underneath it. You've got the NHPP National Highway System. Those are funds that go to the NHS, our National Highway System. You've got the STPG uh, sub allocated program where basically those are the funds that will flow down to roadways to, or to different projects 
based off population. Uh, then you have bridge transportation alternatives, a little bit more of a, a little bit similar to the enhancement uh, program in the past. Planning, recreational trails, safety, HSIP is safety. Uh, CMAC dealing with urbanized areas and reducing uh, carbon or just reducing uh, particulate matter projects that, that help help that. And then freight, and that's for any project that's on the state's freight system. So a little bit of the overlay, I've, we've talked about reauthorization. We've heard about the president's infrastructure bill. How do these all overlap? And that's sort of to be determined. They're kind of separate issues, but they could ultimately dovetail together. So you have here the administration. For them to have to come into the trust fund just to, to stay up with inflation. Potential sources, uh, corporate income tax rate and the capital gains income tax rate adjustments uh, proposed by the president are out there. You would have just debt financing, U.S. Treasuries as an option. Uh, you to see the unused stimulus earlier in the year that was funded out there that looked at that as a distinction. Federal electric vehicle fee, which is right now, it's not something on that having to pay the federal fee bill. Because of the present, mostly we've seen looking at that and updating it. Though there have been some discussions and the idea of floating maybe looking at indexing it, but at present, um, it doesn't seem to be a vi the mo uh, really too viable. That's why it's intentionally not on that list. So I'll walk through the president's job plan initially to give you some sense. Okay, what, wh where did this start out, and where may it ultimately finish? It was 2.25 trillion over eight years. There's sort of the non-transportation, so kind of the people infrastructure piece of it. Uh, 600 billion for manufacturing R and D. 400 billion for Medicaid, 328 billion for housing, schools, and daycares, federal buildings, VA hospitals, and then you get 111 billion for water and wastewater infrastructure, 100 billion for broadband deployment, and another 100 billion for the electrical grid uh, power infrastructure upgrades. So, kind of the transportation pieces, and again. While we have some broad outlines, this has not yet been translated into a, a, a bill per se. And that again will feed into overlap with reauthorization or will it be its own standalone bill? And for transportation funding, including among other categories, the following 174 billion for vehicle uh, electrification, so looking at deploying uh, EV charging and other technologies, uh, retrofitting of other vehicles. Um, 115 billion for bridges, highways, and roads. There was some focus on on you know conditions and and looking at uh, kind of I won't say worst to first, but kind of a heavy focus on those that are are in need. Uh, 800, um, 85 billion for public transit, 80 billion for rail, 50 billion for resilience projects. We'll talk a little bit more about resilience as we look at the House and Senate bills. 
And then 25 billion for airports, 20 billion for a uh, program to reconnect uh, neighborhoods that have been impacted through some transportation planning over, over the last decade. And then 17 billion for inland waterways, ports, and ferries. We're not missing one. I think there was some issue with the when we copied and pasted over. So, so next I'll talk about the House bill, which is called the Invest Act, and it's passed. Uh, it passed the House TNI committee last week. I have my calendar up in front of it, but um, it's uh, 548 billion. Of that, 348 billion for highways, and this is going to be over of, of the period FY22 to FY26. It's a 29% increase over the existing Fast Act levels. Uh, it retains the current core program. So, so that map I showed you earlier, the Fast Act, the tree that showed all the programs, it, it maintains that, but then it adds some additional programs for carbon reduction and resiliency, and those will be coming to the states by formula. So those are going to focus on you know, similar to CMAC, it might be, you could maybe call it CMAC 2, but it's focusing on a sort of statewide approach to, to innovations and in transportation, things to reduce uh, carbon emissions and strategies around that. Resiliency is going to be around projects, you're thinking of coastal areas or other parts of the state where you're seeing repeated impacts due to weather or other changes um, to help make investments to counter that. It has about a billion annually for EV and hydrogen uh, fueling station deployment. 109 billion for transit over this period. It's a 59% increase over what was in the FAST Act. 95 billion for passenger and freight rail, 514%, so a very large increase in investment. And then 5.6 billion for member-directed projects earmarks. So that's that's the earmarks funds. And as mentioned, uh, each of you should have on your desk today, not in front of you at present, but in your desks, copies of all those that were requested for Georgia and what was included in the House's bill. Next, talk about the Senate EPW bill, and, and I'll notice that, that the bill that passed out of House TNI was uh, um, basically a party line vote. I think about four Republicans voted for the bill. The Senate version, the, the complete committee, uh, the whole committee, um, all members voted for the Senate version. Now, again, this is just the highways portion. There are two other committees in the Senate that have further jurisdiction over this bill. But $304 billion for highways, that's a 22% increase. Again, it retains all the current, similar to the House bill, it retains all the current core programs, adds those new programs for carbon resiliency, funds the infra grant program, that's the, the, the mega projects. Um, well, it has, well, we, we've, we were able to get some for a mega project, but um, smaller projects as well, over five billion over four point eight billion over five years. And then creates a new discretionary competitive uh, creates some uh, new grant programs. Uh, uh, six hundred and fifty three million for a bridge investment program, five hundred million for charging and fueling and infrastructure, EV infrastructure, four hundred million for rural safe uh, surface transportation grants. 280 million for protect grants. So we would have resiliency grants, we'd have resiliency um, formula funding, but there would also be competitive grant programs focused on projects uh, dealing with resiliency. And then 100 million for a pilot for reconnecting communities. I'll note one of the things though, mentioned in both House and Senate, that they retain the core programs, but one of the distinctions is the Senate program as a percentage of funding sends more money back to the states through formula. Whereas the House bill, a large, uh, a smaller percentage comes back to the states via formula. Yes. So similar to like the president discussed uh, um, in his proposal, it's projects that you know you have. Uh, one of the challenges that's been identified is over the years as we look, especially in, in urban areas. When you come in and have widened or brought in new roadways, the impact it's had in sort of splitting communities uh, from a historical perspective. It's projects that, and it can run a gamut from hard infrastructure, um, something to reconnect the community, to other ways to improve the economic. Um, when you look at sort of the criteria, it could also be other, other aspects of improving the ec economic connectivity of the community through transit, perhaps, or other things. But that's, that's 
that's what it's targeting. It's a, a more targeted approach to those communities that have been him, impacted historically from, from transportation projects. So we have some funding tables. We don't yet have the funding tables for the House TNI bill, but for the Senate PW bill, you can see where right now we're 1.4 billion, and then under the Senate version, we go up to 1.7 billion coming to Georgia, and then you can see that increase continue to increase to a total of 1.85 billion by the end of the bill's term. And here's just I won't talk through each of these. We talked about the programs, but this just gives you some sense of the funding. Uh, that we come to us by those programs. Again, that's that's the federal policy piece is that those funds are then broken down into these categories. Uh, we'll have to spend it according to those those budget, uh, those those programmatic requirements. So there's a few things around uh, pro improving project delivery that were included in the Senate EPW bill. I'd like to highlight one is codifying some of the one federal decision. I know y'all heard a lot about that over the last few years. Our department's been on the front line of uh, figuring out how we can streamline the process, our inner office of environmental quality, interagency office of environmental quality being one, one example, um, a huge example. Um, so they're codifying some of that. Additionally, they're making it easier for on, on environmental documents for if the work's already been done or you've got something similar, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And, re and really one of the things we always highlight on this is that when we talk about flexibility, we're not talking about changing anything about environmental protection. It's really about the process for reviewing the documents and streamlining. And it also requires the USDOT secretary to track and annually submit to Congress a report looking at the environmental process. So I'll wind up with this. Here's kind of the congressional counter. So we've talked about the infrastructure bill. We've talked about reauthorization. And you can see there's in blue, that's the days that the House is, is scheduled to be in session for the remainder of the year. Red box is the Senate. The House passed, well, the Senate first passed their reauthorization bill out of EPW on the 26th of May. Commerce Committee and the Senate's having their meeting today for their portions. The House passed their version on the 10th, about 5 a.m. in the morning. They started on the 9th, finished on the 10th. And they are scheduled, the majority leader in the Senate or in the House, Senator Hoyer, said that his expectation is the week of June 8th, 28th, they would come in and pass the House TNI bill. And, uh, but as you can see, the September 30th is the deadline for reauthorization as well as the Appropriations Act. So that's sort of one of the hard, fast things we know something's got to be done by that date. Infrastructure is, is, is not quite on a deadline. But one of the things that um, the message today was the, the Senate is beginning to, there's going to be a conversation that if this gang of 10 is not able to reach some type of an agreement, that they will text, take steps in the coming days to initiate the reconciliation process. And then maybe after two weeks, if an agreement's not made, they will be teed up and ready to proceed with reconciliation. Again, that will go back to the, what will the Senate parliamentarian allow them to put in that bill? So just some wrap up, again, our overlap between infrastructure and, and the reauthorization still to be determined. We know what has to get passed by, uh, by October the 1st. You know, if we were to look at all the bills, some of the common themes are going to be electric vehicle, EV, infrastructure deployment. I mean, that's across the board. We see that. And a continuing push is the, as, you know, vehicle fleets, there's a push to get vehicle fleets up, upgraded and more people purchasing electric vehicles. So the infrastructure has to be there. The carbon reduction incentives as well as resiliency so that's something you see as common themes among all the bills and then the next two weeks because of sort of the ultimatum of two weeks or going to reconciliation will probably uh, show us what the path forward looks like whether it's going to be regular order or um, reconciliation and with that thank you josh um you've heard the update to our federal transportation legislation as to what is going on from Josh. Uh, I would entertain any questions from any of our members. Yes. Table. I know what the question is, but um, when, when you talk about um, the decision to go regular order or not, um, reconciliation or not, 
Are you just talking about the reauthorization bill, or are you talking about kind of the, the infrastructure, infrastructure bill? The, the, infrastructure. the current infrastructure, the the, pre, the the infrastructure bill that is president. proposed by the president, and the sides are talking. But okay. yes, and and dare I ask, what are your thoughts on the chances of this bipartisan bill having any opportunity whatsoever to move forward? Um, I would say that there's still a possibility. I think that there's been one of the developments in the Senate has been that what the, some of the some of the uh, Democratic members have, have said that they would if they did the bipartisan bill, they would still like to do reconciliation and do a larger bill. So the question becomes if that becomes what they propose, does that cause the bipartisan bill to then fall off and then they go back to reconciliation anyway? I think the other the other key is going to be on reconciliation, the revenue piece of it. And what do they have 51 votes in the Senate for from raising the revenue right. for the bill? Okay, so, so there's all those components that, you know, there's the why reconciliation might be in, might be the choice, but then there's also the why it might not be the easiest choice and finding a bipartisan bill might be um, strategically better. To, to one last question, I promise. That on the bipartisan bill, I mean, that only gets you five extra votes, you, you still need 60 votes to move forward on regular order, right? You, yes, you still need 60. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any additional question, statement? See a none, so forth, the committee is adjourned. Thank you, John. Thank you. <coughs> this time we'll get uh, uh, on a mobile committee and uh, we'll, uh, Carol Coma is our, uh, let, let's see, we're going to hear from uh, Leanne Trina. Leanne. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us today. Uh, we look forward to the opportunity of presenting an update on the statewide system aviation plan. So today we're going to talk about how the plan's recommendations have been implemented so far and provide an update overall on how it impacts the aviation program. Um, the state's most recent economic impact study determined Georgia's airport system supports over 40, 450,000 jobs, $20 billion in payroll, um, sorry, i look at my numbers here, and has an annual economic impact of nearly $74 billion. Excluding Hartsfield, the state's other 102 public use airports support over 67,000 jobs, a payroll of 3.5 billion, an annual economic activity of 6.9 billion. The annual need to maintain and improve these 102 airports is estimated at 261 billion, million. Also of note, aviation-related jobs support 13% of employment in Georgia, and aviation is responsible for 15% of the gross state product. The purpose of the system plan is to review the existing system and forecast future conditions to provide decision-making guidance for individual airports and system development. The plan identifies airport and facility needs to meet the study objectives and recommends improvements needed for airports to support their role in the system. The statewide aviation system plan is updated every 10 years. The last update was completed in 2018. The purpose of the system plan is to review the existing system and to forecast future conditions to provide decision-making guidance for the, oh, sorry. I'm off, sorry. Check my eyes. So Georgia is served by 103 airports, a very comprehensive system. The plan provides the blueprint for developing these commercial service and general aviation airports to meet the system needs. The state system plan follows Federal Aviation Administration advisory circular guidance, recommendations from the system plan feed into the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems, NIPIUS. Findings and recommendations are also used in local planning efforts, including airport layout plans and master plans. The system planning process includes an inventory of existing conditions, a forecast of future activity, evaluation of the current system, determines airport roles, 
creating facility and uh, service objectives, cost estimates for development needs. All of this is resulting in a recommended statewide system plan for the state's airports. So the documentation includes, as listed here, a technical report that documents the analyses, the findings, and the recommendations, an executive summary, individual airport reports that include specific recommendations for each airport, the cost, and also land use compatibility analysis for areas surrounding the airport and in the runway protection settings. And also a video highlighting the study's findings, recommendations, and highlighting community airport successes. So here we have the existing airport system. And it's 103 airports, as mentioned before. Eight of these are commercial service airports that receive scheduled airline service. The other 95 are general aviation airports. 94% of our airports are in the NIPIAS and eligible to receive federal funds. When the plan was uh, completed in 2018, the state had over 1.5 million annual commercial airline passenger employment, excluding Hartsfield, of course. 48,000 takeoffs and landings by commercial airlines, 4,900 based aircraft, and almost 1.5 million annual general aviation aircraft takeoffs and landings. So the roles for Georgia airports on this slide, uh, airports in the state are broken into levels that are similar to highway designations where all publicly owned public use airports are assigned a role or level in the state airport system. The assignment of airport levels are determined by analyzing many factors, including coverage, accessibility, socioeconomics, and demographics. So the three, the three levels in the system plan, as illustrated here, level one, uh, minimum general aviation airports are similar to our local road systems. Level one airports are the lowest activity general aviation airports in the state. Recommendations for these airports include 4,000 foot runways and non-precision approaches. Level twos are local impact business airports. These are comparable to state highways. Level two airports are higher level activity general aviation airports. 5,000 foot runways, non-precision approaches, and weather reporting systems are recommended for these airports. And we gave you a breakdown of the acronyms there on the weather related items. And then level three, regional impact business airports are more like our interstate and include the highest level activity airports and commercial service airports. Recommendations for these airports include 5,500 foot runways, approaches with vertical guidance and weather reporting systems. This slide shows the plan's recommended airport system and distribution by airport role. Of the 103 airports in the plan, there are 30 level one airports, 30 level twos, and 43 level three airports. The plan recommended additional and replacement airports that we have illustrated here. The plan recommended an additional level three general aviation airport in the Dawson for Scythe County area. Recommended a change to the Midcoast Regional at Wright Army Airfield from a level two to a level three airport. Replacement of a level two, the level two Griffin Spalding County Airport was recommended and replacement of the recently closed Level 2 St. Mary's Airport is recommended. Excuse me. Go back to that just one moment. Yeah. Okay. What's up there? Um, what is that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. My phone's on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go, go over that again. That So yes, the um, a level three general aviation airport is recommended for the Dawson Forsyth County area. Okay. And we have a little bit more information on that later in the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The plan established a series of performance measures to evaluate the airport system. These measures are generally tied to accessibility to certain system features. The evaluation process was conducted using drive time analysis uh, supported by GIS, Geographic Information System. The process considered accessibility to Georgia airports as well as accessibility to airports in neighboring states 
The rating shows the percentage of Georgia's population that's within the specified drive time to an airport that exhibits each of these criteria. And we use some color coding in the right-hand column, the current accessibility rating to explain it a little more, you know, what that, what that number needs. So areas where accessibility could be improved are noted in yellow, first and last. Light green indicates that accessibility is nearing the practical limits of the system. And then dark green performance areas are fundamentally at their practical limit. The first measure, commercial service to rural Georgia, is dictated by the airline companies. So this is a difficult one to improve on since it's based on service to population centers that have propensity to travel. And then the last performance measure on the slide pertains to the pavement condition index, which has our focus and will be discussed in more detail in a, a little later in the presentation. Yeah. And also, the airport system provides excellent uh, access for rural communities allowing the communities to participate in you know, economic development. Per Site Selection Magazine, Georgia's airport system is one factor enabling the state to capture its number one ranking for doing business in the state and the nation. And here we have an illustration of the system plan improvement as compared to facility and service recommendations from the 2002 system plan versus uh, 2017 when the inventory was conducted for most of the system plan. As you can see, federal, state, and local investment in the system has resulted in improvement in all categories of system plan recommendations, especially those related to aircraft operations, that's runway length, width, taxiways, lighting, and aircraft approach procedures. This slide highlights the change in system performance for runway length recommendations for each of the different airport roles. Significant improvement has been made uh, via the 2008 Air Georgia program that provided 28 million for 18 extension uh, runways. And more recently, with the 2018 runway extension program that extended runways to 5,000 feet or more in 13 communities for the cost of 26 million. Today, 95% of level three airports meet the 5,500 foot recommendation. 90% of airport level two airports meet the 5,000 feet runway recommendation, and 67% of level ones meet the 4,000 foot recommendation. Access to longer runways is a very important economic driver when a community is looking to attract business and industry. Business aviation is the fastest growing segment of general aviation where 5,500 runways can accommodate 95% of the business aircraft fleet. So here we have a saturation map that illustrates a 45 minute drive time to level three airports with 5,500 foot runways. State residents accessibility for this measure is 97% of the population and almost 98% when you include airports in the surrounding state. Currently 44 airports have a runway length of 5,500 feet 24 have a runway length of 6,000 feet or more. So the remaining 3% that we're working to get to 100% uh, will be partially improved by the recommendations of the system plan. But some gaps remain due to factors like you see here, areas that aren't blue or orange. Um, some of those areas are the Okefenokee Swamp. Uh, we have military base locations and then areas with very low population. But access to Georgia's airport system by citizens is extremely high as compared to other states, with previous investments allowing the state to rank as one of the best in the nation. The plan identified projects that are needed at each airport to meet the airport specific facility and uh, service objectives. The state has a statewide air, airfield pavement management study that identifies maintenance and rehab projects for existing runways, taxiways, and aprons. Significant investment is needed each year just to maintain the existing infrastructure. The system plan also identifies the financial requirements for additional and replacement system airports. Finally, as a part of the plan, cost estimates to bring all runway protection zones, RPZs, under airport control were also developed. When all inputs were considered, a total investment of at least 1.3 billion over a five-year period would be needed to meet the goals and objectives of the system plan. This slide shows the cost broken down by airport level and project type. 
to maintain and improve the Georgia airport system in order to meet system plan requirements, significant investment is required. The plan shows the average annual investment need for Georgia airports, excluding Hartsfield, is at least $261 million. On average, annual funds available to apply to the needs of the Georgia airport system on average is about $63.7 million. Based on the historic average annual of funding, there is that very significant fund gap. And of that 63.7 million, 41 million are federal dollars, 13 million state funding, and 10 million in local funds. Based on the 2020 Georgia Statewide Economic Impact Study, these same Georgia airports have an average annual economic, economic impact of almost $7 billion, $6.9 billion. The Georgia airports are providing an economic impact that far exceeds the annual financial need to maintain and develop the state airport system. For comparison, uh, this slide provides the FY21 airport aid budget for the southern states that Georgia competes with for business and industry. Airport access and facilities have long been a critical site selection criteria for new and expanded businesses, with Georgia ranking fourth in the south for airport investment. So here we just have a, some highlights of the recommended performance improvements from the system plan. A recommendation uh, was to improve airport pavement conditions, as I mentioned a little while ago. Uh, the conditions are deteriorating faster than our investment. A follow-on pavement management study was conducted resulting from the system plan, and it indicated a deterioration of airport pavement condition index, where on a scale from 0 to 100, the index in 2002 was 77, and in 2018, the index had fallen to 71. The system plan also recommended improving the 45-minute accessibility to level three airports for all Georgia residents. Analysis identified areas not already served by a level three airport, so we could use that information. And then this also includes information we went over a, a couple slides ago about additional and replacement airport recommendations. So where, where we are today with the recommendations made by the plan, we have made some, some progress uh, and initiated the, a few things since the conclusion of the study, including the pavement management study. It was conducted to focus on prioritizing, prioritizing pavement, maintenance, and rehab. Uh, as said before, it indicated $58 million are needed in annual investment to achieve an area-weighted pavement condition index of 80. So we're at 71 now. And as we talked about earlier, beginning in 2018 and now nearing completion, the Governor's Runway Extension Program enabled extensions of 13 runways to 5,000 feet or more. Wright Army Airfield's runway was extended to 6,500 feet and is now a level three airport. And the city of Dawsonville and the Dawson Forsyth County area is considering conversion of Elliott Field to a publicly owned public use airport based on the growth in that area and the need to access, the need for access per the system plan. Replacement of the Griffin Spalding County Airport is underway with land acquisition and utility re relocation currently underway now. And finally, the Camden County St. Mary's Airport, uh, they are in discussion with, with us now with the department on relocation of the St. Mary's Airport due to its proximity to Kings Bay Base. So looking ahead at other planning projects identified as a result of the system plan that are planned or underway, these include airport LIDAR obstruction surveys that will identify runway approach obstructions throughout the state to help airports maintain their safety standards. The system plan also identified airports are needing to improve control of runway protection zones to ensure obstructions are removed and incompatible land uses not encroaching on airports. The program will work to help airports prioritize projects in this area using federal funds under the block grant. And an air cargo study has just started due to the recent trends in e-commerce triggering significant growth in the air cargo area, an understatement. Um, airport infrastructure will be examined to accommodate air cargo demand based on this new business trend. And finally, development of an airport land inventory ownership is underway using GIS um, in an effort with the FSA 
per requested by the FFA that the department undertakes to ensure that sponsors have accurate land records and ownership of land when future projects are considered. So in conclusion, our slogan here, Georgia airports mean business, is not just a slogan considering the economic impact of the state's airport to the, and the importance they play in connecting communities to the national, national and world economies. The total annual economic activity of Georgia airports excluding Hartsfield, is $6.9 billion. Weighing this against the system's planned $261 million estimated annual investment needed illustrates that Georgia airports are definitely a worthwhile investment because in Georgia, airports mean business. Thank you so uh, much for the opportunity today. Jerry. Uh, if an airport not how's that? Is that difficult to get ongoing? Uh, obviously, you need to go somewhere first. I mean, how difficult it is? What's the process, though? Is it a long process to get that through? Yes, and I have to turn to the guru who is with us today. <laughs> Good afternoon, Steve Bryan, I'm the aviation program manager. Um, it is very difficult to get new airline service these days. Obviously, the economy with the you know COVID. Uh, can we just really put everybody's um, plans on hold? Yeah. Um, so it's very difficult because airlines are trying to consolidate and people drive to them. So it's more difficult, especially when you look at Jack, uh, Hartsfield Jackson in the backyard of almost Athens in comparison to what um, other cities uh, experience. So it is a very difficult assignment. Um, the Athens folks are doing a really good job of trying to get new service. I think they have a chance. So we're out there to support them uh, any way we can. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Leanne, for that presentation. This this question may not be in your lane of what you're about uh, just a moment, but I think it's about four or five years ago we heard a presentation that uh, considered the possibility of another major commercial airport in Atlanta on the north side. And I was very excited and intrigued by that report and the potential possibility of that but i never heard anything from it once that report happened four to five years ago are you aware of anything regarding that report and what the current plans may look like for such a possibility i'm familiar with the report i, I don't have an update today but i can investigate and see what i can find out and get back to you thank you are there any other questions? Yeah, we appreciate. Thank you. And we're real appreciative in the state of Georgia for all these small airports that you have, particularly Southwest Georgia. We'll, <laughs> yes, sir. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. That, I will. Okay, so we just kind of hang up. We need to make sure we uh, hold a two thirty, please. <laughs>
Welcome, Mr. Patrick Allen. Hey, good afternoon. He's talking about you. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman and members of the uh, uh, committee, proper utilization. Uh, I'm going to continue the dialogue about Board Rule 672-11. Uh, which governs the accommodation of utilities on GDOT right away. Uh, it's largely uh, focused on these telecoms, these uh, private uh, for profit companies utilizing the right away, but we've also been able to bring some of the other more predominant types of utilities into the fold uh, under Board Rule 672 11. So, uh, with that in mind, when you think about utilities, uh, you really think about those water lines and gas lines and things that are underground along the right away. Uh, sometimes they, they tend to be out of sight, out of mind until something happens. But, you know, we have to have forces to administer permits and to uh, ensure that those those utilities go into the ground or above ground, like electric or, or uh, telecom. Have forces to make sure that they go in in, in accordance with our manual. Uh, any fees collected under this board rule go to support that effort, the GDOT effort to process those permits in a timely fashion, and it deals with the ongoing maintenance of utilities in the right of way. So that's permitting, inspection, and the ongoing uh, coordination and dealing with utilities once we get on a construction project. So we talk a lot about traditional utilities. Uh, this rule has also allowed us to accommodate things that are not quite utilities. Uh, if you look at that picture on the bottom right, uh, that's what you call a small cell node, uh, supports 5G technology. So under the uh, guise of 672-11, We've been able to update our utility accommodation manual and accommodate things like uh, fiber optic cable, which also supports those 5G antennas. And again, those are not what you would think of as traditional utilities, but are very much uh, privatized uh, uh, infrastructure, again, companies providing service uh, for cellular communications and even just moving data from one point to, to another. And some of that transmission of data does support the uh, deployment of broadband, broadband technology. So today, I'll walk through a overview of the utilities program here at GDOT. I'll talk about the purpose and need, uh, some of which I just touched on for updating board rule 672-11. Uh, on a high level, I'll talk about some of the industry feedback that we've uh, received over the last uh, year or so uh, dealing with this rule. And then I'll go through the uh, what's proposed in the new rule, a comparison of the existing um, and the new. And then lastly, we'll uh, make a recommendation to open this rule for public comment, uh, which I think will happen on, on tomorrow. So the GDOT uh, utilities program is nationally renowned. Uh, we feel like we're second to none as far as DOT's utilities. Um, and we're very much a, a service group to the utility industry. Uh, we touch at least 14,000 permits per year, uh, results in about 9,000 approvals. Uh, Tremendous, tremendous volume of, uh, of work um, done by our district staff and our folks here at State Utilities Office. And we also have uh, consultants that kind of help us out to make sure we stay uh, laser focused on that customer service. And even with that volume of work, um, we're able to turn permits around and, and far less than our goal of uh, five days. So we're on average a little less than three days. And that's been the case for the last uh, two or three years running. So with the volume of infrastructure uh, going in the right away, volume issues we have uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, that it doesn't really stop there. Next part of that is as we have projects, uh, there's a continued need to ensure that those utilities can re be relocated in a timely fashion. So again, that same personnel that's touching those thousands of permits are also the same people that are responsible for ensuring that utilities get plans, uh, our design plans, and provide that link between our designers and the utility companies to ensure we've got a good strategy for getting things out of the way or uh, identifying where conflicts do and do not exist. So again, a tremendous amount of work uh, that's done by our GDOT staff and consultants. Um, and again, that's funded by fees collected under Rule 672-11. So another uh, large component of the GDOT utilities, court, utilities program is, again, permitting the facilities in a right of way dealing with them as we work through the pre-construction process. And then once plans are developed, it's left to contract. And then there's the, the third piece of that puzzle is dealing with those utilities on construction. Um, as many of you may know, 
uh, utilities can have a tremendous impact of uh, delivery of on time and on budget construction. So again, we have to have staff available to ensure that uh, utilities are getting moved in a timely fashion. And again, these things are all, all connected. So as we talk about uh, board rule 672-11, we're talking about annual fees, recurring fees again, because it's not, it doesn't just stop at issuing the permit and putting utilities in the ground. The work continues uh, even as we let projects uh, year after year. And right now we have about 480 uh, active construction projects that we're, we're dealing with across the state. And the previous slide, I, I think there's roughly 2,000 projects if you include our traditional LED projects and things like quick response and ITVs that our utilities team is dealing with. So again, a, a tremendous uh, workload. And so just some highlights on that staff, I mean on the, uh, the staffing required to do this work. You know, we have about 37 personnel across all seven districts. Uh, about 17 folks here at One Georgia Center and then embedded consultants that help us out tremendously on the uh, delivery of um, utility coordination activities. So board rule 672-11 uh, was established in the 1980s, uh, many, many moons ago. So again, our, our first objective is to definitely uh, modernize. Uh, if you read the rule, it talks about long distance telephone and trunk communications. And again, you know, some of you may remember when long distance telephone was was definitely a luxury. It wasn't something that that everybody had or was a necessity. But that's that's about the time when the, the, the rules put in place targeted towards long distance telephone. And then now we've managed to use the same rule to accommodate the uh, te technology as it is as emerged. So and you look at the uh, the pictures on the slide, it's kind of the evolution from long distance to uh, cable or video service. Again, that was a, a luxury at one point in time. And, 1996 Telecom Act kind of opened the door for more cellular communication and that fiber optic technology and the uh, emergence of the internet. And fast forward to today, you know, everybody's streaming. You know, so you don't have a phone company or internet company or cable company. It's really just kind of one thing. So as far as us consolidating and streamlining, we've recognized the, uh, the change in technology and, and we're updating the board rules to definitely uh, accommodate that those developments. So again, now everybody's kind of streaming. And then there's also a nexus between utility deployment, particularly fiber and some of these small cell nodes where there might be an opportunity to overlap transportation needs, you know, for some of these same locations where this technology is being uh, being deployed. So our objective here is to modernize, streamline and consolidate uh, the existing rule and make it more uh, easily, more easily administered and also accommodate the newer technologies. And then another piece of this is ensuring that we at GDOT is doing, are doing our part to ensure or promote rural broadband connectivity. There's a lot of a lot of fiber in the ground around the state. Um, most of it just happens to be in, uh, in urban areas. So part of this rule update is to do our part in promoting that rural broadband deployment. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, the technological advancements. Again, the, the new rule is, is technology agnostic. We're looking at uh, fees associated with permits, not so much uh, miles of fiber, miles of cable being put in the right of way. But so that trunk communications and long distance tele, um, long distance communications was definitely a, a target for updating the uh, just the definitions and looking at something more aligned with broadband services. So no matter if it's wireless or fiber or coaxial cable or copper, we're really just talking about the transmission of data and the issuance of a permit. Again, that's part of our effort to uh, consolidate the uh, the board rule and update it. So from an industry perspective, um, I touched on this briefly. Um, the industry was very uh, adamant that we promote the uh, deployment of rural, rural broadband. And then also working with uh, DCA and the Georgia Technology Authority, DCA being the uh, Department of Community <coughs> Affairs and their efforts. And many of you have probably seen the broadband map that they developed a couple of years ago. So they've got a pretty got, good idea of where the unserved and served locations are around the state. So we've looked at that data pretty hard to try to match it up with where we've issued permits or where we need to promote uh, permit issuance to, to bridge that gap in the uh, digital divide. And then the other uh, key point is ensuring that we're in compliance with federal and state law, looking at things like the Telecom Act and the uh, Georgia state statutes. And then lastly, uh, ensuring that we have a way to transition from the old to the new, again, dealing with some of the uh, 
all the agreements that we have in place. And what you'll see in the new rule is that we separated telecom utilities from non-communications technology uh, utilities. I'm sorry. And those non-communications communications technologies are your power, gas, water, sewer. Um, so again, that distinction is there. Uh, we've had a long-standing policy not to uh, assess fees to your traditional uh, county or city-owned water and sewer companies. So again, they will continue to be excluded. And then we'll also uh, make provisions for dealing with EMCs who are getting into the uh, broadband business as well. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. If you wouldn't mind the, the previous slide. Uh, maybe you mentioned it and I missed it, but that point, rule applicability to local agencies. Can you expand on what that is just a, just a bit more? Bit more? Yes. yes, sir. So there, there's a statute where uh, if a, a telecommunications company doesn't have a um, retail end user in a certain jurisdiction or city, um, then they are able to revert back to the GDOT rules in terms of uh, fees. Uh, most cities can charge a franchise fee to the company. So that's what that's about. You know, the companies were, the industry was interested in how this would apply to that particular point of the statute. Um, it's a little bit of a rare occurrence because a lot of these telephone companies, they do have end users in that city, but that's, that's what that, that is in reference to, just our link to that particular uh, code in the statute. <laughs> So that's not used in a way to uh, for either a local government or us as, as a state to circumvent one another. No, it's, it's not. It's definitely not that. Again, we we kind of stand alone. Again, our, our program is pretty robust, but there is that provision in the in the law that that kind of links the two together. But we don't we don't supersede any uh, jurisdiction. All right, so the, uh, here what you have is the current rule on the left and the proposed rule on the right. Uh, I, I could spend a lot of time kind of diving into the old rule and the, the applicability, but just in the uh, Reader's Digest version of that, you know, we, we're able to charge based on locale. So if you're looking at that table and if you're in an urban area, um, an urban area defined as anything, any city with a population greater than 5,000, the fee for that print, uh, facilities in that right away would be $5,000 per mile. Um, and again, depending if you're in rural or, or local roads, again, there's a corresponding fee to go with that. But the new version uh, looks at just the permit itself, whether it's less than a mile or greater than a mile, uh, looking at our operational costs for processing that permit. Uh, that's where those dollars come from. And that's the initial issuance of the permit. Um, as I spoke about earlier, you issue the permit, but there's it doesn't stop there. There's continuing coordination and things that have to happen beyond the initial issuance, and that's where the recurring fee comes in. Um, so, again, that's, that's kind of a, a simple high-level uh, explanation of what you're looking at. And then the current rule doesn't even contemplate uh, wireless facilities, things like small cell antennas, and that's something that we've added. We've had a, a section specifically dedicated to uh, wireless facilities. And again, this significantly uh, simplifies it, um, definitely reduces the cost to providers for uh, putting facilities in our right away. So we, we think we've got a proposal that works and will be accepted well by, uh, by those that are interested. Uh, yes, sir. Cable TV, internet, high speed internet line wants to cross or go down a roadside. That's the schedule. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, for specifically crossing, there is no fees for uh, for crossing the roadway. So we're talking about a longitudinal installation. Um, and what I, I didn't mention is that we also have provisions for uh, to encourage co-location. So if two companies came in and wanted to go in the same trench, you know, we can offer a discount for that. Or if they want to go aerial co-located, there's also a discount for uh, aerial installation. Okay. okay. Um, so now, uh, again, that concludes my update for the board rule. Uh, we'll ask that uh, this be opened up for public comment. Comment period would end on uh, August 5th, 2021. If, if, if
just to add to that. Sir? Um, on the back page of this handout, it, it appears that fees under the new rules, uh, fees paid to GDOT go down by 90%, or in some cases more than that. So where where was that money going to before, and what do we do with that's a rep, that's a change in revenue to GDOT? Yeah. Yeah, so th this is a sample just kind of based on uh, some high level things that we put on paper, but we've, we've done some analysis and, and this actually works. Again, it, it does a great benefit to companies that are paying that per mile. Um, and then there are some uh, some situations where non-communications utilities, you know, it, it there's a balance to be had there, but we wanted to, to do this, taking an approach that we maintain our ability to function and run our program at its current current level. But again, just just in in terms of hard numbers, what what is the proposed net change in dollars to GDOT? Uh, is, is it net net even? It's, it's net even. Yeah. And again, this is just kind of a, an example of you know random permits of a of a certain length. So. Any other questions? We need to make this yes, Commissioner. Just uh, just a few comments, point of privilege. I want to clarify Patrick, Patrick said a few things but I want to re-emphasize those one one I want to thank him uh, Patrick is no longer the state utilities engineer as listed on your agenda he's been promoted to the office of materials and testing so we appreciate Patrick not forgetting what he knew as he is now over the office of materials and testing and tomorrow you'll pay a privilege to Miss Monica Flournoy for on her retirement uh, as from OMAD as we affectionately called it but uh, this has been an ongoing dialogue um, and to Mr. Abel's question is we, we focus on providing a service and sort of again back to those uh, those KPIs and the volume of work and the ongoing nature of dealing with utilities in the right of way no matter whose they are and we focus on that as, as basically a service so that our goal is never to be revenue generating but just to cover our cost but there is a dynamic that has changed recently and and will continue to expound upon the amount of utility permitting necessary with the expansion of broadband Patrick mentioned the word digital divide that we know that exists across this state and and DCA and GTA and the uh, whole effort uh, of trying to deploy more broadband across the state uh, we know is is coming our way and when you looked at the current rates on a per mile basis, there was a little bit of disproportionality, even though the rates are different in the rural areas, there's a whole lot less users per mile than there would be in an urban area. I mean, just think about that. So we really try to get back to what is it that is the mission of the department, and that's to provide excellent customer service to allow, again, private for-profit companies to utilize a public right-of-way uh, that was funded with transportation funds and not use transportation dollars so we're just trying to figure out how to offset those costs so the dynamic is really good question because the dynamic is changing in the permitting world and there was different and various and sundries uh, of permit permit fees based on other things like the long distance <laughs> and we were joking that uh, I had a party line growing up I don't we were addressing party lines too I hope right uh, hopefully we get those addressed um, so that would <laughs> so, so, but to the point is uh, EMC, so uh, our electrical membership corporations uh, are getting into the broadband business and when they have broadband partners with the EMC, there is no fee to them as, as they are and as they are EMCs in the broadband business, a very clear delineation there. So that's a, again, a very big promotional factor to broadband expansion into rural Georgia and unserved areas. And so I think that's very important. So again, trying to right size the program, modernize the program, uh, really a cost-based program for Patrick and his staff and, and consultant teams to deliver really a great result. So uh, it's been a lot of hard work. Uh, there, are, there are complexity, lots of complexities to this uh, that I don't want to take for granted. Uh, and uh, commend Patrick and John Hibbert and, and the entire utility team for working and listening to the industry. And the industry is a broad industry uh, in the telecoms from, you know, from very large, you know, providers to somebody's trying to provide to the, the most rural place in Georgia. So 
uh, feel like we've got a good balance. Uh, we will. The good news, and through all this, is again this this what's on the screen is uh, open for public comment to in, continue to engage and work with all the industry that's related to utilities uh, across the state. So, Patrick, I want to say thank you personally because you won't have a privilege of being up here for a utility purpose going forward. But maybe next month you'll bring us an update from OMAT. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that point of privilege and just yes, wanted sir. to share that uh, as well. All right. Do we need a board? Or do we need approval from the board to open the uh, motion? Okay. Your second. Yes. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you. Thank you. We now stand adjourned. We got a few minutes before we start the uh, committee as a whole. Tim, how are you going? Good to see you.
At this time, I'll ask Miss Meg Perkle if she would come forward. We're going to have an update on the 285 express lanes update. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the board and commissioner. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today and provide an update on the P3 procurement approach for the express lanes on I-285. I'll review our current P3 approach on the I-285 express lanes, how we're evolving those plans to get better value to all I-285 users, and the next steps to expect in the months ahead. So this map shows the express lane system as planned in Georgia. The purple are the existing express lanes, the green are the MMIP express lanes in active development, and the yellow is the long-term unfunded plans for additional express lanes. We are working to build an extensive system of express lanes in Georgia. With the projects we will complete as part of the MMIP, Georgia will have the largest network of express lanes in the country, about 278 lane miles. The success of our existing express lanes, especially the Northwest Corridor, give us real world positive results that we can point to as we expand the system. In the Northwest Corridor, we've seen one-way commute times reduced by 45 minutes, speeds in the express lanes up 30% faster in the peak hour, speeds in the general purpose lanes doubled from 20 miles per hour to 40 miles per hour in the opening year. Transit commuters experience shorter and more reliable commutes an average of 15 minute reduction in the trip time with a 12% increase in trip reliability. When we reflect on the impact of the Northwest Corridor on congestion and delay, we can imagine the benefits of an entire system with system to system connectivity to express lanes. As you can see from this map, I-285 is the required hub to the spokes of connectivity with I-75, 85, 420. So let's talk about I-285. Currently, express lanes on I-285 are proposed to be, delivered, to be delivered in four P3 projects. That's 34 center line miles, 124 lane miles, and about 6.1 billion in capital costs. We know that I-285 is home to four of the top 20 freight bottlenecks in the nation and supports some of the largest traffic volumes, not just in the state of Georgia, but in the nation. Trip times on the northern half of I-285 are anticipated to become more unreliable in the future as traffic volumes and delays increase. The current traffic volumes on I-285 average about 238,000 vehicles per day. In year 2032, which is the proposed open year for the express lanes, it's about 263,000 average. It goes up to 297,000 average if we don't build the express lanes and that's because traffic becomes bogged down by volume, throughput reduces. With express lanes, we're projecting an average of 335,000 vehicles per day, with up to 66,000 of those in a guaranteed trip time in the express lanes. So as shown previously, we have four express lane project construction packages that are part of the MMIP on I-285, but they don't all look the same. On I-285 top end, the express lanes includes two barrier-separated express lanes in each direction. So in operation, it would feel similar to riding along in the Northwest Corridor. On the I-285 west side and east side express lanes, both include one buffer-separated express lane in each direction. So operationally, it would feel more like the I-85 experience where you're in a lane and then there are general purpose lanes right next to you. And they also, on the west and east side, stop short just north of I-20. So this provides limited capacity with only one lane in each direction on the east and west wall. And similar to I-85, even when that one lane is clear, customers hesitate to go much faster than the congested lane that's right next to them because there's no barrier separation. In 2016, when MMIP was first envisioned, we proposed projects that we knew we could deliver with the current funds we have over time. Like when you're buying your first house, you figure out what you can pay in a mortgage, and then you look for the house that fits your budget for your monthly mortgage payment. In our current P3 model, the private sector finances the project and we pay it off over time in availability payments. 
We've reserved the mortgage payments for these projects for the next 35 years, and they are represented in the statewide transportation improvement program and the long range transportation improvement pro pro program. Since 2016, CERTA and GDOT have experienced a lot of success in Georgia with express lanes. We've become more sophisticated and developed a strong track record of innovative delivery, and tolling has gained increased acceptance in, G in Georgia. We've seen the benefits express lanes can bring, and drivers in Georgia have experienced them and, and, in, and embraced them in the corridors where they're an option. So we've been investigating other models to bring expanded infrastructure solutions to our state. We have a unique opportunity with this heavily congested corridor that lends itself well to provide a more improvements and benefits with the P3 market. With that, we've worked hard to develop a new model that enhances project value, reduces public funding, and brings greater benefits to the traveling public. So what I'm saying here is this, with volumes and demand present and projected in the I-285 corridor, these projects have the strong potential to optimize private funding. So the state needs to take advantage of that. We were already doing a P3, but we are always looking for a more innovative way to deliver a better, more efficient solution and to stretch our public dollars. That's our job. We're shifting how we will deliver the express lanes on I-285 to an innovative private revenue model. Ultimately, expanding the project scope while shifting greater financial responsibilities from the state to the private sector partner. Why are we doing this? Let me explain. Building on CERTA and GDOT's experience in delivering transportation projects through public-private partnerships, the department is pursuing the next level of public-private partnership, a P3 private revenue model, where the private sector partner will take on greater responsibility to fund, operate, and maintain the express lanes on I-285. Market analysis and comparison projects tell us that this corridor is ripe for this kind of a P3. P3 projects delivered through a private revenue model have proven effective in several states, including Texas, North Carolina, Virginia, and Colorado. GDOT is pursuing this approach now due to favorable market conditions and strong interest from the private sector. Part of that increased interest is a result of the success established through our current express lines and because of the larger vision GDOT has shown through the established MMIP program. In addition, the new model brings potential opportunity to expand the scope of the, east, of the I-285 east side and west side express lanes by incre increasing express lane capacity with an additional express lane in each direction and updating the buffer separation to a barrier separation. Barrier separated means more consistent trip times and safer travel within the lanes. Additionally, we may have the opportunity to extend the southern terminus of each project to the I-285, I-20 interchanges on both the east and west sides. We think that a private developer may seek that connection to I-20 and possibly other additional access points to attract more users to the lanes. Lastly, this new model increases the potential for enhanced <coughs> transit in the corridor. So let me go a little bit deeper into what these benefits can look like with this new approach. First, customer service focus. The private sector takes a strong customer service focus approach under this new model. The private sector partner is incentivized to ensure superior performance of the project and an exceptional motorist consumer experience, since the partner, they are relying on motorist usage in the resulting toll revenue to pay for the project. As I stated previously, there is a potential for more access. And that's because the private sector may want to provide more access to attract more users. At the end of the day, they are competing with a free option, the general purpose lanes right next door. So no one has to use these lanes. They have to provide excellent customer service to attract customers. Being responsive to transit enhancements, we've proven that transit operators will have more reliable and consistent trip times in express lanes if two lanes in each direction are provided. Under the new model, the potential for transit infrastructure investment will be explored with the private sector. There's a strong support from the I-285 Mayor's Working Group referring to express lane transit along I-285. MARTA has been discussing the funding and capital build-out of express lane transit in partnership with the ATL so that they can bring in Cobb Transit and Gwinnett Transit. 
And we want proposers to show us what they can do in this project to be responsive and supportive of those plans and provide innovations with transit operations. And it's interesting to note when Josh presented the um, House T&I bill that has been passed recently in Congress for transportation reauthorization, there's a new definition in there for express lane transit that was put in there by Representative Carolyn Bordeaux. Express lane transit is defined as an integrated combination of bus rapid transit and toll managed lanes that allows for limited access entry of toll paying vehicles to restricted lanes while prioritizing transit's need and use of available capacity in order to improve transit performance. So we've created something new for the nation. Greater time savings. Again, barrier separated, two lanes in each direction means even greater time saving benefits and a safer trip with fewer crashes in the express lanes, as well as more capacity for users in the general purpose lanes on I-285. And finally, the last benefit, developer retains debt obligation. What does that mean? It means that the developer relies on the success of the lane to pay for the project. They have an incentive to provide excellent customer service, including timely completion of construction because they need customers. They will still have access to the low cost public funding offered through TIFIA and PABS that we are offering on our current design build finance project. The major difference here is that the state is not guaranteeing to pay back the developer. So let me walk you through a side-by-side -side comparison of the two models. Keep in mind that they are both P3 models. P3 equals public-private partnership. It is not the same as privatization. This is still a partnership. CERTA and GDOT will determine the business terms and policies of the procurement and will remain actively engaged as partners throughout the contract terms to manage for contract compliance. Important, it's very important to balance the risk that the developer takes on with the need for public control. So looking at the first two lines there, one and two, these are about the build out and what the lanes will look like. We'll have more lanes, more capacity, and they'll be barrier separated. This means better trip times, better reliability, safer travel, and consistent trip times for transit. So in other words, more value, more project. The third line there refers to O&M operations and maintenance in the corridor. With the new P3 model, we move to a more holistic approach to operations and maintenance to maintain the whole corridor. Lines four and five are about tolling. Toll rates will be determined with contract param within contract parameters established by CERTA. Remember, again, this is a partnership. The private sector partner will ultimately set the tolls that reflect market conditions, meaning variable toll rates with higher tolls during peak travel times, and they'll be adjusted much more frequently. Keep in mind that having two lanes instead of one means less congestion, so that still would be lesser toll rates than if there was only one express lane in each direction. In other words, it's just re re reactionary to supply and demand and that affects the toll rates. Finally, the last two lines is about the contracting and financing of this project in the new model. This P3 model is closer to self-funding than any other model used today in Georgia. GDOT can potentially see significant reduction in the need for public funding over 40 years. The private sector will bear the investment costs needed to deliver the project and the ongoing financial risk associated with the project. And we give them a longer contract time to allow them to take on that risk. 35 years changes to 50 years. A comment we hear is that tax dollars are used to build express lanes and then taxpayers are charged a toll to use them. So this method greatly reduces that criticism. The state will have limited liability should the private sector not be successful. So what happens as we move forward with this new P3 procurement model? We are currently in the process of refining the concept in environmental and permitting documents. Top end users won't really see a big change in the physical look and feel of the proposed express lanes, but the east and west walls will see a change with the additional lane and with barrier separation. As we refine these concepts and the environmental documents, we will also be refining the schedules in the next few months. We've been engaged with the public and local officials since the start of MMIP. We've received a lot of feedback from the public, and the good news is 
We've heard a great deal of positivity about express lines. The positive comments we've heard are all still part of these projects. CERTA and GDOT will continue to engage with the public for input, as well as continue to work with local and state elected officials around I-285 as we move to this new model. And lastly, we are working currently through all the fine details, the devil's in the details, procurement strategies and contract parameters, many of which will be refined through engagement with the industry. CERTA and GDOT will host an industry forum later in this year specifically for potential industry partners. We will also take the best practices from the projects that have come before us in other states and use that information to craft the best procurement for Georgia. Optimizing the contracting approach, allocating decision-making authority, defining the operating structure and required interfaces between GDOT, the developer, and CERTA will be the key to driving interest in the project and providing opportunities to maximize the value of the project. So at the end of the day, we'll be getting more project, more value for less public dollars. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to take any questions. Is there any questions, Tim? If I can get this mic to work. Uh, Meg, I just really want to say thank you for all your hard work. This is a uh, thinking outside the box. And uh, I love the idea of public-private partnerships. Uh, this offers a solution we've been looking for. But I want to say to you that um, your work is always outstanding, and, and this has been a difficult task. And just want to say thank you for all, all, you, all you're doing, all you have done, and continue to do to make this happen. Uh, it seems like a good solution to me. Uh, coming in today with the traffic, uh, for one reason I was late, I mean, we've got to think outside the box. How else are we going to solve this solution up here? And, uh, I mean, it's getting to the point, anybody from South Georgia doesn't want to come to Atlanta. Let's face it, it's difficult. So uh, I don't know what else we can do, but I really appreciate the hard work and what you continue to do and just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Kevin? We're working on Mr. Chairman, I've got a few comments that I want to read um, for the record, if, if I may. Um, as, a member, as a member of the State Transportation Board, whose district includes a substantial portion of this project, um, and as the current chair of the P3 committee, I'm particularly interested in this initiative. I recognize that my knowledge and understanding of the vagaries of P3 contracting are dwarfed by the experts on staff at GDOT and I'll gladly continue to grow my knowledge by learning more from them. I offer these comments now not to suggest in any way that I know more or understand more than I do. I just hope that some common sense challenges from the board will serve as additional incentive to GDOT staff as they work diligently to effect a successful procurement and ultimately project delivery. I had the opportunity to discuss the topic of the chief engineer's presentation with both her and the commissioner yesterday. I expressed my thoughts then, and I want to express them again today for the record. Following our items for consideration that I urge GDOT staff to take into account as together we proceed down this new procurement path for I-285 express lanes that Meg has just described to us. <clears throat> the, big the big driver for this new approach seems to be get more for less, specifically an extra express lane on the east and west sides and a reduced cost to the taxpayer. Potentially, the developer will also be incented to build BRT stations, ELT stations maybe, and grow transit options, but this is not clear at this time. Once we sign a 50-year agreement with the concessionaire, we're subject to the whim of the marketplace for any public policy goals that might arise after the fact. Examples here might be incentivizing electric vehicle use and building transit infrastructure. I'd like for GDOT and CERTA to articulate their must-haves early on for a successful contract so that we will know going in what we will definitely get versus what we hope we will get, i.e. market-driven. <clears throat> I've been doing some research on P3s of this ilk, and I understand that three key ingredients for a successful contract are, one, minimize compensation events due to breach of competitive restrictions, i.e. building an alternative parallel highway. B, number two, put a cap on allowable ROI achieved by the developer. 
i.e. after they achieve a certain ROI, GDOT should participate significantly in any incremental um, revenue gains or profit gains. And thirdly, accelerate the deployment of the developer's equity funding during project delivery to ensure that their stake in project success is maximized earlier in the design and construction cycle. I trust that GDOC will work to include these and other key business terms into our list of must-haves early on in the discussions with prospective developers. Along these lines of articulating must-haves, it seems to me that incentivizing the use of transit, i.e. MARTA's uh, BRT plans, on the 285 express lanes would work against the ROI calculations of a developer who would want to maximize toll revenue. Again, I just want to be sure that if we truly do want to see BRT increased transit on 285 is an outcome of this initiative. We stipulate this as a requirement for the project early on. Once we've, cut, once we've articulated our must-haves, it'll be important to get confirmation from the vendor community, the developer community, that they actually want to engage in a procurement process with the aim of winning such a deal. I suppose that the industry forum will be the time to do that. We've already gone to the public with a funded initiative to build express lanes on 285. It's not like we're saying we have to do the project this new way or there are no express lanes. What we're getting is incremental infrastructure at a supposedly lower cost. That is fine, but I am concerned about pushback from the public to whom we've already communicated. This isn't a, rea this isn't a reason not to make this change. We just need to anticipate it. GDOT has articulated the positives of making this change in procurement approach, but not the risks. I'd like to see a clear statement of risks, including timeline risks and mitigation strategy as we move forward. The top end of I-285 is the second most heavily trafficked corridor in Georgia, with projections for volume that make the current infrastructure impassable in the years ahead, as Meg pointed out. The current design and procurement approach is the second major effort to bring 285 to where it needs to be. The first approach didn't go anywhere and many years were lost. I want to be sure that as GDOT begins to take this new approach to the procurement of 285 express lanes, we ensure that we are covering all bases, both those that address our transportation policy goals, as well as those that address the risks of this new procurement approach. So thank you very much for your consideration of these comments. Thank you, Mr. Abel, uh, for your comments and your concerns. Uh, uh, Jamie, Boswell. Thank you, and I, and I appreciate Mr. Abel's interest in this, and obviously he's done a lot of work, uh, work to figure out that what's the best way to move forward with this. Uh, Any time that we do projects of this magnitude, you're going to have kickback from somebody. But, I mean, it goes back forever that if you're going to get these projects done, you're not going to get 100% approval on any of these projects. All we can do uh, what I want to do is I think we have the perfect group of people in our organization to move this forward and make sure it's done with the least amount of risk to the state and the best way to move traffic around 285. Uh, I feel very confident in our group that we will be able to move forward and I support it 100%. Thank you. Are there any other comments on uh, this presentation at this time? Thank you, Meg, for this this uh, presentation, and it it certainly you know represents the great work that y'all are doing, and you and you know all of the P3 uh, people and and how to get and develop um, the 285 uh, in the future for this for our city and our state and for the citizens of this state and for trying to fix the traffic situations that we are dealing with. And this certainly is a proposal that works, I think, well, will work. I think it's, yes, we all gonna have some concerns. We'll work through them as we go and we will, we will, we will carry this project across the goal line and it'll be a, a real impact on our city and our state and the future of this state. And I thank you again for the great work of all of the people at GDOT that have been putting so works so hard, so diligently on this project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if I may just say, I think that all of your concerns are very reasonable concerns. 
and that um, they should be considered in all P3 procurements. And we'll work together with CERTA moving forward to make sure that we address these concerns as we get into the details in the next few months. Thank you. Thank you, Zidi. Okay, any other questions? Mike Dover is going to give us an update on district on the district update. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, commissioner. It's been a while since you all have heard an update from our districts. Uh, we've had a lot going on in the past year, and the districts have continued to deliver the program and the mission for the department even during the pandemic. So today, I'll highlight some of the continued great work that goes on that you all aware of, or maybe not be aware of, that goes on in our districts. So this is an overview of uh, what I will be talking about today. Um, first off, the district operations during the pandemic, and also the district response efforts from a statewide perspective to assist other agencies and local governments in response to COVID-19. I'll talk briefly about some major projects and the district's efforts to deliver the program during the past year or year and a half. And as always, routine maintenance and operations is a primary district responsibility. I'll give you all an update of some of these activities, and what's ha been happening during the past year as it relates to uh, routine maintenance and operations. And, and as you all hear almost on a monthly basis now, uh, an update on our emergency operations and preparedness and, and recent responses. So this is just the sign of the times here, just like here at One Georgia Center and everywhere, every office in and around the country and the world. Uh, the districts implemented COVID protocols and began to work in a virtual environment in March of 2020. <clears throat> we were able to adapt very quickly and efficient, efficiently uh, to this type of operation in the district offices. And that's, this implementation of this plan was what was called our continuity of operations plan, or our COOP plan. We referred to it several times, the plan that we had in place to be able to work remotely uh, long before March of 2020. And we continue to focus on that plan uh, even during March, April, and the early stages of uh, the pandemic last year. So we had our first in virtual introductions of a new district engineer, Ms. Key organized stakeholders from Congressional District 5, a virtual introduction of new district engineer, Paul Denard. This virtual introduction was well received by the local delegation and the local governments. And this is something that we'll continue to implement virtually for introductions for our board members in the coming uh, months and years as uh, we progress with uh, new staff. Up next, uh, just the delivery of the program during the pandemic activities in uh, District 4, uh, Passing Lanes and Lowndes County continued uh, to support delivery of the program. District, this is District 4's survey crew in Lowndes County. And then I uh, mentioned about our statewide GDOT response. So very early on, as you all were kept informed during the board meetings as it went progressed and April, May, June, July, August timeframes, uh, GDOT worked in coordination with all these agencies to coordinate the loading and delivery of testing kits uh, and supplies, masks, gowns, face shields, PPE, bulk sanitizer to 15 regional coordinating hospitals throughout the state. Uh, these efforts were coordinated through the Department of Public Health's uh, warehouse in Kennesaw, uh, the frequently all the districts participated in this and they were frequently uh, making deliveries of these supplies six days a week. So here, just a few pictures of uh, what we have undertaken during this time. It seems like forever ago now, but uh, this is some of the activities that we did back during the summer in the early stages of, of the pandemic. Some more pictures of our crews loading up pallets of supplies. We heard a lot about pallets of supplies delivered to regional hospitals uh, during during that time. Um, so we had resource requests, just an idea of what a re resource request is. The districts uh, or local governments or agencies make what's called a resource request to GEMA. Uh, then those are relayed to the agency that's most responsible to deliver those resource requests. In this instance, these were GDOT related resource requests. We completed 550 of those. Um, which included uh, barrels, cones, pallets of water, message boards, travel trailers, and even fabricating and setting up signs. 
Back last summer, we assisted eight state parks with barrels, cones, and signs, and also set up some of the local local government testing sites. And this is a location at the airport through August and September of last year, almost a year ago now, uh, where we assisted with the mega site uh, set up and coordination. It, uh, we have manned this site by providing cones, barrels, traffic control, signs, and we staff daily. Uh, some of the site logistics, 750 cones, 300 barrels, message boards, signs, eight, ten, ten employees per day man this particular site. Uh, we had a mechanic because of the of the uh, vehicle issues that were waiting in line to help be able to assist those, get, get those out of the line. And this was staffed primarily by District 7, 35 employees in District 7, and as well as the state maintenance office. So then we go into the February through May timeframe of this year where we supported the GEMA and Department of Public Health at mass vaccination sites. So in February, GEMA opened up four mass vaccination sites you all are familiar with and heard about uh, during that time. They were Habersham, the Del Delta Airlines site at the airport, Macon and Albany. And then March of this year, GEMA opened up an additional five mass vaccination sites in Bartow, Chatham, Waycross, Sandersville, and Columbus. So all seven districts and the Office of Equipment Management delivered resources to the mass vaccination site. Again, signs, water, uh, cones, barrels, managing traffic control, message boards. Um, and we also performed that asphalt paving there, and that's in Habersham County to be able to provide that drive-through site for that mass vaccination area up there. And this is just an aerial view showing the cone, the barrels that we had set up in Waycross, and then the site also in Bartow County. That one has more traffic, and it, the traffic going through those particular uh, vaccination sites that we uh, have to coordinate with state agencies. And so I move on to the project updates. You all heard a little bit about 16 and 75 last month. So this is the interchange at 16 and 75, the bridge over the Okmulgee River. Of course, the district office employees perform construction oversight, inspection, and valid verification of place materials. It's a progress photo from October 2019 to June of 2021, and you can see traffic moved on to the new bridge over on the right-hand side of that photo at that particular interchange, moving on. Uh, freight improvement in within that particular corridor has been going on. Actually, today is the uh, anniversary of the ribbon cutting for this particular project. It was four years ago. The next project down at the ports, this is a coordination project uh, with Ports Authority to accommodate uh, Georgia Ports Authority's mega rail. Again, the districts perform construction oversight, uh, construction management, Validation materials, contractor coordination. This has had an aggressive intermediate schedule to be able to allow the ports to to lay their rail lines underneath the at that particular location under the bridge at Pipe Makers Canal. And then, of course, you all have seen this particular photo. This is from three or four months ago. This is our communications office has gotten great at virtual ribbon cuttings. This is down at I-95 at Belfast Keller in Bryan County, um, open to traffic on January the 22nd, 21. Again, district uh, involvement was construction oversight, construction management. So, and then one more, this is up in, uh, here's talking a lot about the truss bridges over Lake Lanier being replaced, built in the 50s when the lake was built. Uh, this is one of the last of those truss bridges up there over Lake Lanier uh, in Forsyth and Hall counties at the Chattahoochee River. And then on the right, we continue to enhance intersection safety with uh, two roundabouts at Dawson Forest Road and State Route 9 up in District 1. So I'll move on now to our Quick Response program. Uh, quick Response is a program you all have maybe heard me talk about in the past. Uh, smaller type improvements that the district can be able to identify uh, allows us to attain the contract 
from contractors to make improvements on projects less than $200,000. So um, by policy, we obtained three bids for those particular improvements. One of those bids is from a DBE firm by policy. Uh, and this is a, a, a location in, in, in Springfield in Effingham County, uh, enhances pedestrian improvements, rapid uh, flashing beacon, rectangular, rap, rectangular rapid flashing beacon installation in downtown uh, Springfield. And then here's another quick response project. This is an offset right turn lane to enhance safety at this particular intersection. You see the project on the left hand, or the view on the left hand side with the right turn lane and then the project, uh, the picture on the right hand side has an, what's called an offset right turn lane to, to allow uh, better visibility along that particular state route. <clears throat> so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the ITBs. You heard Patrick talk about quick response and ITBs in his particular presentation. So a few years ago after the passage of the Transportation Funding Act, uh, we presented to you all a program for procurement of our contract routine maintenance activities called Invitations to Bid, or ITBs. You hear us refer to that a lot. Uh, it gives us tremendous flexibility to roll out routine maintenance activities and services. Uh, this uh, particular project here is a shoulder widening performed with an ITB contractor in At Atkinson County. Some of those ITB activities, pavement preservation, which allows us to extend the life of our pavements. Talk a little bit about that in these coming up slides. Striping, concrete rehab, and vegetation management, which I'm sure you all have seen a lot of those activities going on in the last three or four years in, in and without the state. Just a, a little bit of the flexibility of an ITB. This is a striping project um, in uh, Whitfield County up in uh, District 6. Uh, and as you can see, um, just enhancing uh, pedestrian crosswalk at uh, State Route 3 and State Route 71. It gives us these pro type of uh, projects give us great flexibility to roll out routine maintenance types activities with uh, contractors. And so far this fiscal year, FY 2021, we've awarded 219 ITBs uh, at an amount over $92 million. So we're closing in on the fiscal year here. Just another one of these uh, pavement preservation. You can see on the left hand side that roadway has already been crack sealed uh, for pavement preservation. On the right hand side, it's been treated with surface treatment, continue to provide that pre those pavement preservation activities to enhance the life, uh, the life cycle of our pavements. And then finally here uh, is uh, uh, resurfacing uh, in uh, State Route 73 in Scraven County. <clears throat> so with, uh, with the implement of the ITB's uh, contracting, that has allowed our crews to become uh, more focused on their activities. So this is some of our in-house work from our employees. This is chip seal, which is uh, some aggregate on top of liquid asphalt and then rolled in. Uh, this is something that we performed in State Route 90 in Atkinson County. And even in drainage repair in Thomas County, down in District 4, uh, improving that, that particular head wall and that drainage area at, at that particular location. So just one other project in downtown Ringgold that our uh, forces uh, were able to undertake is uh, a rehab of shattered concrete base, unstable subgrade and drainage issues on State Route 2, State Route 3 in Catoosa County. These are all activities that were performed by in-house forces. And then I had mentioned crack sealing. Uh, again, just as something as simple as preventing the water from getting into our base and pavement there extends the life uh, cycle of those particular pavements. And then District 7 performing uh, spa repair on, on the interstate, be able to replace that broken concrete section there and replace that. So, And then one other uh, slide here about flexibility we have implemented with our equipment. Uh, this mini excavator here purchased with attachments. So we have one piece of equipment uh, with, that has attachments associated with it that we can change out those attachments and be efficient. This one here is uh, mechanically cleaning a side drain pipe. And, and you can see the work that it is doing. That is an attachment that goes onto this mini excavator. 
This excavator has also other attachments that allow it to be flexible and be able to utilize, utilize that piece of equipment for uh, more than that one activity there. Uh, talk about emergency response a little bit. Again, you all have gotten updates uh, monthly about emergency response. So this is uh, what had happened some up in District 1. District 1 over the winter had 13 call-outs for either forecast of uh, some kind of winter weather activity uh, through this past winter. And then, of course, over the Christmas holidays, we had an event where we had some 860 employees from all seven districts, uh, even uh, to be able to respond to events that may have happened in uh, district, m mainly from Metro Atlanta up to the north. And really thankful for those crews uh, from uh, District 4 who treated I-75 all the way to the Tennessee state line. So. Uh, and then this is uh, as a result of the spring storms back in March of this particular year. This is a this storms up in March uh, in March uh, created this particular slide up in Raven County. So we were able to get a contractor uh, to put in a, what's called a soil nail wall, and they're actively performing this right now. And you can see some of the progress in those particular photos going on. Uh, at that area up there. The same storm caused this up on State Route 180 in Union County. <clears throat> this is something our district forces were able to undertake and repair uh, at that particular location up in uh, Union County. And again, all, all that, of course, uh, was in at the same time as the uh, Noonan tornado, the EF4 tornado um, in District 3 provided the initial response for that particular location, ultimately supported from employees from District 2, 4, and 7 to help remove the debris and haul the debris. The, uh, the uh, governor's declaration took place from March 25th to May 25th. Uh, this is the path of that particular storm. Uh, and then I'm uh, extremely uh, grateful and proud of our folks for being able to spend that time down there and help those folks in and around Noonan, Noonan and Coweta uh, County. Just a few of the, the, uh, the numbers. Uh, District 3 in-house, 6,000 loads. We worked also in Herd and Polk counties uh, for four days, 216 total loads of debris from Heard and 82 loads from, from Polk County. So that brings me to uh, the reaction to emergencies. So of course, June 1st was the uh, official beginning of the hurricane season. The districts have already been preparing by conducting dry runs. Uh, key components of the hurricane plan, and this is a photo of field operations on I-16 um, for the potential contraflow of I-16 that involves three districts, five, uh, two, and three coming from the coast inward. So uh, counting barrels there, of course, there's lane closures involved at the crossovers, and then the gates too at those particular locations. So. Uh, we've made tremendous progress in our emergency operations plans and preparations over the last five years. So including the use of technologies like cameras and drones, purchasing generators uh, and additional equipment. So just last month, as we do before any seasonal time frame, before we do before the hurricane season, before we do before we enter into the winter weather season, we conducted uh, a dry run con conference call for readiness. You may think the dry run conference call would be with just maintenance or TMC or the operations folks, but really it is department wide. Uh, this is really a team uh, event and uh, we have uh, report outs on readiness at that particular, at those particular conference calls from districts, communications, 
finance, procurement, IT, and human resources. So we really all come together uh, when it becomes time to respond to an emergency. We'll make those plans and those dry runs and those conference calls as well. So everybody knows exactly what their particular role is when it comes time to do that. So with that, um, I will uh, say that I certainly appreciate uh, what uh, you all, the relationship that you all have formed with district engineer. Uh, if you're a longstanding board member, a new district engineer, that relationship, or uh, if you're a new board member and you form that relationship with those districts and those district engineers, and I certainly appreciate that. So that represents just a small portion of what has gone on in our districts for the past year, year and a half, as we continue uh, to deliver the mission in the field for the department. Thank you. Um, Mike, um, Chairman Bowen asked me to take um, of the chairmanship of the meeting. He had to take a call, but you know, so I'll, I'll start by saying thank you for that presentation. You know, it, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all the members of the board in expressing our appreciation to you and to all the district engineers and the men and women across the state who do the work every single day, 365 days a year. It's, it's quite incredible. So thank you for that. Are there any questions? Yes, I have a question. It's not close to what you were speaking about today, but as I was traveling down in state 16 for the last month and a half, I noticed all those trees being removed uh, in, the, in the median area. So what's the extent of, of, of what GDOT's doing as it relates to that particular project? Yeah, so we uh, we have actually put together some guidance for the districts. If it's vegetation management, if that's what it is, it's usually uh, to the clear zone, which is 32 feet plus an additional for recovery. So we're clear in that for safety purposes mm -hmm. down through I-16, mm -hmm. as we've done on I-75 and uh, throughout the interstates. Uh, throughout the state. Okay, so they're just doing 16 from Macon to Savannah? Doing I-16, that's probably the activity that's going on right now is I-16 from uh, Macon to uh, Twiggs County, and you're talking about Twiggs County? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I know they've cleaned it out very well. And I was just wondering how, how much further they were going to be cleaning out down 16. We should go uh, at some point in time as we program and budget and manage our funds for those particular activities. It should be all along the interstate of I-16. Okay. All right. Thank you. My, I just want to comment, and uh, it's about the district engineers in, in my congressional district. I have three. Two of them I know well, and one of them I haven't met in person yet, Tyler Pete, but I, they do an unbelievable job. Uh, I mean, I could not ask for any better service than I get from the district engineers, and I just want to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike, um, I'll call the adjournment to the meeting for the Committee of the Whole. I think we're done for the day.